If you find this healing sleep meditation sleep story helpful or interesting, feel free to give it a thumbs up, share with someone who may find it useful and leave any comments below. If you don't want to miss any future sleep stories, you can subscribe and click the bell notification icon. My sleep stories are made with you, for you, and posted weekly here on YouTube. You can access all my sleep stories, add an introduction free on my sleep stories podcast, my alternative to Patreon, where you can also download the stories for offline listening. They are also available without this YouTube introduction, on most streaming and downloads services like Apple Music, Amazon Music and Spotify. If you're interested in what else I offer, you can find details of all this and of my hypnotherapy and autism e-courses, books and merch in the description and on my website danjoneshypnosis.com. So I hope you enjoy this story. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close. And allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this guided sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation, I don't know whether you'll drift deeper to the sound of my voice or the spaces between my words. And as you begin to drift comfortably and relax to sleep. You can have a sense of being on a train and it's an old fashioned train, it's a steam train and all of the wood of the train is carved so ornately with such incredible craftsmanship. And you can hear that train as it clickety clacks over the track. And you're on a long journey. And you're traveling out from London on this steam train, heading north. And as you leave the lights of London, so everything outside the window gets darker and darker. And you can see the shadowy figures of the trees passing by the sides of the train, out of the windows. You can notice the full moon illuminating distant hills and countryside. You can notice pockets of towns with small areas of lights dotted among those fields. And you're on this journey with a friend. And as it's getting later and later, while you make this journey, you relax back into the seat. And you have a table between you and your friend. You have some bits put down on that table. You tuck yourself up into the corner near the window and the edge of the seat. You wrap yourself up in the most snuggly, warm coat. And you just close your eyes for a minute. And with your eyes closed, you can feel that movement of the train continuing along the track. Hearing the clickety clack of the train on those tracks. You can hear the mumble of other people on the train in the carriage. And you feel the sense almost like being rocked gently asleep and you begin to comfortably drift and float into a reverie and this train journey is a long train journey 
it'll be traveling all the way up to Scotland. And you don't have a bed to sleep in during this journey, which is why you're going to sleep here. And you'll try and drift asleep and stay asleep all night long. So that you wake up just as the train arrives in Scotland and as you near your destination. And while you drift into your reverie, you start to have this sense of paddling a boat down a river, almost like the rocking of that train on the tracks becomes the rocking of the boat on the water. And you begin to hear the sound of the oars as you push the water back, raise those oars out of the water, hearing the slight splashing of the water dripping off of the oars before the plopping sound as you put those oars back into the water and push them through the water again, propelling that boat forward little by little. And you can feel the warmth of the sun and begin to have a sense of your surroundings and discovering yourself rowing down a river, seeing forest on either side and a lush green bank between the water's edge and the start of the forest. And you realize that you're having a lucid dream, that you're aware of dreaming and aware that this is a dream, but at the same time, having a level of control over the dream, an autonomy in this dream. And so you continue going with the dream, rowing down this river. And after a while of rowing, you pull over to the river bank. You climb out of the boat, you pull it up onto the shore a little, and you can hear the sounds of the forest, the rustling leaves, the sounds of birds, the distant sounds of monkeys and other animals in the forest. And you can discover a sense of deep relaxation from those sounds, from the greens and the blue sky, the colours of nature. And you set up a camp on the edge of the river bank. You gather some wood from the forest. You shave off some of the outside of some of the wood. You start a campfire and you sit by that campfire listening to it crackling and popping, feeling its warmth and noticing the sun setting, the changing colours from the blue sky changing to oranges and reds and then to a dark blue, and then noticing the stars in the sky, bright white and twinkling, and noticing how as the sky changes colour, so the animals that are making sounds change as well. The daytime animals quieten down and certain nighttime sounds begin to increase. 
and you notice that the sound of the water of the river changes as the temperature of the air above the water changes. That it sounds more relaxing and softer as it flows by. And you appreciate that glow of the fire far more now the sun has set and the warmth from that fire. And you relax back into the camp that you've built. And as you're aware that this is a lucid dream, you can begin to have the thought of the unusual nature of falling asleep and dreaming about falling asleep. And almost with a smile on your face, you relax back in that camp with the sound of that crackling fire, the sounds of nature, the sounds of that water flowing by. And you drift so comfortably, so peacefully asleep. And the next morning, when you awaken, feeling so incredible, so invigorated, so full of energy and ready for the day ahead, you're surprised to be greeted by the most beautiful swarm of butterflies with almost electric blue incandescent wings that seem to shimmer and almost sparkle in the morning sunlight. Almost making it look like there's blue sparkling diamonds flying through the sky, seemingly erratically just shimmering there. discovering it's almost hypnotic with the amount of silence that's there. And you watch as they fly by and then they begin to spread out and they head into the trees and seem to land in the trees. And you notice more and more butterflies appearing and then flying into specific trees until those trees almost seem to vibrate with twinkling, sparkling coming from the wings of those butterflies that seem to almost outnumber the leaves of those trees, making the trees almost take on an electric blue hue. And then once those butterflies have settled in, you instinctively continue your journey. But you continue on foot for a little while as you head along the riverbank a bit before turning into the forest and beginning to push your way through that forest. And to start with, it's hard going pushing through the forest, but as you get in the swing of things, you find it gets easier and easier. And after a while, you find yourself coming out into a clearing and in this clearing you can see an ancient temple that looks like an old pyramid. And you walk over towards that temple. And you first of all walk around the temple. You run your hands around the stonework, really appreciating and feeling that stonework under your fingertips. 
and then you go to the entrance. You push open a stone door, which seems to slide open far easier than you would expect for a stone door. You light a torch, hearing that flame burst to life on the end of that stick. And you walk inside the temple. And as you walk inside the temple, so you can notice the way the light dances and the shadows move around the walls. You can notice the breeze softly blowing through the entrance down into the chamber, past your cheeks, around your neck, almost softening and relaxing the muscles around your neck, almost like the gentlest, softest massage, almost like fingertips, just gently encouraging the muscles to relax. giving you a sign that being here is safe, is a calm and relaxing place to be. And you notice the way the sound has changed from outside the temple to inside the temple. The temperature has cooled slightly. And you can hear each footstep gently echo off the walls as you walk deeper and deeper into the chamber. And after a while, the chamber opens out, almost like there's a large hall. And in the middle, you see a hole. And you head over to that hole and you shine that torch down the hole and you can see that it's a long way down and there's a rope ladder leading down there. And so you carefully navigate your way down that rope ladder deeper and deeper beneath this temple. And when you turn around and you look around you, you can see symbols all over the walls. And they all seem to somehow intuitively make sense. Although you don't feel that you've ever seen them before. Almost like some kind of proto-language. Something that just instinctively seems to make sense to you as you look at it even if you've never seen it in the past. And you work your way round and realise it's telling the story of an ancient civilization. It's telling the story of a civilization that was given knowledge from people from the stars. And you continue to read this story, walking around this underground cavern, it talks about these aliens landing and educating about where they came from, educating about facts about the earth, sharing different knowledge. It talks about some of the technology that they had. Things which made no sense back then. And then it talks about them leaving and then becoming worshipped almost like gods. 
hoping for a return one day. And always looking up to the stars. And building temples, pointing up to the stars. Trying to align the temples with the specific stars in the area that the aliens came from. And then, once you've walked all the way around, almost back to where you started, you see that the last thing seems to almost be a ritual that seems to say that there was a magic spell that you could do to connect with the gods. And then it describes it. And it says to use the chair in the middle of the room. And so you look over, you check out that chair. And you realise that the chair is actually like a curved, body-formed rock that looks like it's carved out of a single stone. And then you read what you have to do. It tells you to sit on that chair and that the chair is orientated towards the relevant star. And you're to focus your attention on that star, which is at an angle just above your head. And with all of your attention on that star, you're to count back in your mind and as you count back in your mind, you extend each out-breath, deepening and relaxing yourself, and training your brain waves to, net, to connect with a targeted frequency beam of psychic energy from the aliens from that world. And you don't know whether this will work. But you decide to give it a go anyway. And so you go and sit on that chair. You put the torch in a holder beside you. You find that chair surprisingly comfortable for one made entirely out of stone. You realise as your fingertips touch the stone around you that that chair, that stone, seems to be so soft, almost like touching soft rubber, except that it's got the firmness of stone. And you close your eyes. And you begin to breathe, calming yourself down a little. And then you focus on where that star is, just above your head. And you begin to count backwards. And as you count backwards with each out-breath, so you drift deeper and deeper relaxed. And the deeper and deeper relaxed you become, the greater the connection you feel. Almost as if you have this sense of energy beginning to synchronize. Almost like where you have two waveforms, two notes, and you're trying to turn the dials. And you can hear how those notes are gradually getting closer and closer to each other. You can hear the difference between each frequency until all of a sudden you can just hear the single frequency and you just have the one note. And you suddenly connect with that frequency. And you realise that you're not connecting with other aliens 
you're connecting with an automated psychic beacon that seems to pulse out knowledge. And you can feel that knowledge passing down into your head, down through your body, almost filling you with that knowledge and wisdom of the universe. And you suddenly have this sense of the word fortitude. And you wonder about that word. And that knowledge passes through you. And while it's passing through you and into you and filling you up. And you can feel yourself learning wisdom. You notice that it's passing into you almost like it's got colours. Like it starts working through the colours of the rainbow. And you can feel a sense, almost like you have an aura around you, changing colours. Until all that knowledge is within you. And then that beacon seems to stop. And as the beacon stops, your eyes open and you find yourself on that seat. And you climb off the seat and you feel slightly lightheaded with all the knowledge that's just entered into you. And you start thinking and introspecting about that knowledge. And you realise that you seem to have access to everything that's just happened. And you pick up the torch and you find your way out of the chamber. Back up into the main part of this pyramid, of this temple. And all the way out of the temple. And as you exit the temple... So you hear the sound of a train whistle. And you suddenly feel the ground rocking slightly. And then you hear the clickety clack of the track. And then you can feel the coolness of the window on the temple of your head. And you gently open your eyes and you find yourself sitting opposite your friend on that train. You see that it's not yet morning, but the sun is probably not far under the horizon. Because there's a little bit of light outside, enough for you to be able to see that a thick fog that's low to the ground seems to have appeared around the countryside. And you can see the way the train is passing through that fog, the way it's almost spraying up like something passing through water. And you can see when you look up that the sky is still clear. There's just that very thick, low layer of fog. You can see the tops of trees, the tops of tall bushes as you pass by them. And gradually see more and more light beginning to appear knowing that morning is approaching. And then, suddenly, something unusual happens. You see what almost looks like lightning within the fog. And there's no sound to that lightning. Just flashing light within the fog. And zigzagging lights 
within the fog. And then in an instant, there's darkness. And then almost an instant later, it seems to be the middle of the day. And you find yourself on a train in unfamiliar surroundings. You're looking out the window still. And yet what you're looking at now is a mountainous area, but not Scotland. It's not the area you're expecting to see. And even if it was, it shouldn't have changed this much in such a short space of time. And you notice that others on the train, who are also awake, are equally as perplexed by this. And the train slows down and comes to a halt. And a guard walks down the train and is telling everyone in each carriage there's nothing to worry about. Something strange seems to have happened. And they're just looking at what that is. And the driver's just trying to figure this out. And so you and your friend get up and walk to the door in the carriage. And you want to go outside and investigate, see where you are. And so you tentatively open the door, peer back down the track towards the back of the train. And you can see back there seems to be almost like a black hole on the track that seems to have some fog around its base. And what looks like electricity sparking off of that hole. And you get out of the train and you walk towards that. And then you see somebody appear who explains that a science experiment has gone wrong. That they're working on trying to make things invisible by manipulating electromagnetism. And they had to pump more and more power into their experiment. And they were trying to hit a critical amount of power. And then they hit that amount of power, but instead of the thing they were making invisible turning invisible, it seemed to open up a rift through space-time. And that seemed to open up here. And that it didn't just open up one rift, that by manipulating and twisting electromagnetism, it somehow warped space-time, opening up eight different rifts, almost all in a circle around the central experiment. And they've been travelling around to get to each rift, to check each one out and to make sure that nothing comes through them. Only this one happened to be right on a train track and unfortunately a train was coming along at exactly the point where it suddenly appeared and the train had no way of stopping or avoiding it. And so here they are. 
and you look at those scientists and you can instantly notice they definitely don't look like they're from your time period. They seem to be from a time, a long time in the future. And just some of the words they use don't really make sense. You can understand them, but they seem to just talk a little differently, like their language is slightly different, yet familiar. And so you ask about how to get back. And they say that they'll need you to go back through with the train but they also need to close these rifts and that they could perhaps do with your help and the help of others to make sure that everything goes back the way it was. And they want to know what it was about these locations and so they want to be able to interview the people who've come through they want to know about the experiences. And so they check out that nothing else is likely to come through this rift. They make sure that no other trains will be coming along that bit of track. And then they begin to interview people on the train they find out in one carriage, people are carrying on, almost unaware of what's been going on, almost unaware the train's even stopped. They're just so busy celebrating a birthday, having a bunch of people standing around singing happy birthday to one of the children and giving them a cake, that child blowing out the candles, and then focusing on opening presents as if it's a typical morning and you ask why they don't seem bothered and they say that it's one of the children's birthday they're carrying on things will get sorted in their own time it's not a problem it's just more to talk about and share about the experience. And then in other carriages, there are people complaining about how they want to get to their destination. And then the staff attempting to talk to them and tell them everything will be okay. They'll be on their way shortly. And these scientists talk to the different people, ask them about their experiences, what they saw, what happened, what they were doing beforehand. And there's no easy way to get the train back through the rift. Because the train struggles with reversing with all the carriages behind it. So it has to make a journey further down the line to a junction where it can pass onto a different track that curves around and then comes back to another junction that allows them to rejoin this track again. But then when they're back through the hole, back through that rip in space-time, they'll be facing the wrong direction. So they're then going to have to somehow safely do a similar thing on the other side. Then the driver's talking about how unfeasible that is at the other side. And so they have to try and figure out an alternative way back through that rift. And in the end, they find that the only way 
is that all the people will have to go through separately to be back in their own time. So as they get interviewed, before it gets sealed, they all step back into their own time without a train. And then the scientists say that they'll use some of their machinery to push that train backwards once all the people are off of it. And so when everyone's back through, they all stand aside and they can see through that hole. Advanced looking technology that seems to almost hover just above the ground, almost hovering on blue light. And that blue light seems to make the lightest humming sound. And they begin to push that train backwards while having other machines steadying the carriages. And part of it pushes on each individual carriage as well as just the engine. Because part of the problem is that pushing on the engine, which is the heaviest part, can push and end up damaging the carriages behind it. And so it seems to be such a slow process of that train just carefully inching its way back into this reality. And noticing how the sun has now long risen and is already almost on the way to setting again. And eventually, just as the sun's setting again, having spent an entire day not moving any further than this rip in space and time, and the whole train is through, and the scientists double check that everyone is on the right side of the rift. Before then, doing something on their side, and that rift vanishes. And you turn to your friend. And you ask them if they just saw what you saw, if they've just spent the day having the same experience. Because although you know that you have, a part of you feels you need to hear it from someone else. And they tell you that they have just shared this experience with you. And that no one will probably believe them. When all the passengers try and tell others what happened. And everyone boards the train again. And the train continues on its journey. But this time... You don't fall asleep as the train continues on. You arrive in Scotland. And rather than arriving around the middle of the day, you arrive very late at night, many hours before the sun's rising. And you leave the train. You head off to a hotel that you're staying at. You sit in the bar for a while, talking with your friend. You have a meal. One of you eating kidney, the other eating lasagna. And then you head off to bed. You go up to your room, you find room 42, open the door, you get that smell of a hotel room, 
in an old hotel full of wooden beams. You lie down on the bed, the most comfortable bed you've ever slept in, and you wonder whether that bed is extra comfy because of the journey you've just had, because of the couple of days you've had, because your last night's sleep was leaning on a window And you sink so comfortably into that bed. And you drift peacefully asleep. And the next day, you awaken in good time for breakfast. And you sit at the desk in the hotel room. You pick up the most beautiful fountain pen that's on that desk and the hotel's own notepads and you decide to write with that pen and you can hear the slight scratching sound of that pen as it moves across the pad you can see the ink going from wet to gradually drying on the page before your eyes and feel the flowing of that ink through the pen as you continue to write and so you continue to write that note just writing down your thoughts from the last few days writing down what you've been grateful for what you look forward to And a smile can come to your mind while you read that back to yourself. Before tearing off the sheet of paper from the pad. Folding that sheet of paper. And keeping that sheet of paper on you. While you leave the room. Head down for breakfast. And you meet your friend at breakfast. And then both. After breakfast, head off out, feeling the coolness of the air outside the hotel. Seeing the Scottish Highlands. And hiking your way up. Into those Highlands, looking over the locks. Smelling that fresh, clean air. Feeling the wind on your face. And just enjoying being in nature. And then as you hike across the highlands, you see someone walking towards you. And as they walk towards you, you look forward to seeing the dog that they've got walking beside them. But as they get closer, you notice it isn't a dog. They've got a cat walking along beside them. And they stop and they say good morning. And as they stop and say good morning, you look down at the cat. You see the cat has stopped also and the cat is now weaving around this person's legs and they notice you looking at the cat and they say that the cat Tyrone goes everywhere with them that Tyrone loves adventures and so you lean down and you crouch down and Tyrone comes up to you knocks his head against you. You put out your hand, he rubs his head against your hand, then his neck wiggles his ears, rubs his side against you and his tail. 
as you let his tail slide through your hand before Tyrone turns around and comes back to rub himself against you again on the other side of his body before then seeming to almost lose the use of his legs and flopping down like heavy weight onto your feet and starting to purr and you almost instinctively have that sense of stroking his belly, his side, and you can feel the warmth from him. And after a little while of stroking his belly, even though he's purring away, suddenly he seems to clasp at your hand in a playful way, almost seeming to wrestle with your hand. And then you know you have to continue your journey, and they have to continue theirs. And so you stand up, and you can see that Tyrone really wants to stay and play. And you know that you can't and they can't, and so you continue your journey. And once you're at the highest point you can go, you look out over the view. You close your eyes, breathe in some of that fresh air. Breathing that deeply into your lungs. Almost like breathing in relaxation and then breathing out any stress or tension. And then you gaze down over a lock. And you can see that it would be very easy to make the journey down to one of those lakes down there. And so the two of you head down towards that lake. And when you arrive at it, you put your hand into the water on the lake's edge. And you feel that that water seems to be surprisingly warm, that you're expecting it to be cold. And then your friend explains that this specific lake is over an area of hot rock and so it always stays much warmer than the surrounding areas and so you get yourself kitted up for going for a dip in the lake you tentatively walk into the lake and once you're up to your waist, you lie back and you close your eyes and you just feel that weightlessness of floating on the lake, the warmth of the sun on your face, the coolness of the breeze on your cheeks, the feeling of that water tickling your skin with the surface tension and that water being of a temperature that's just right to make it so that with your eyes closed as the water becomes more still as you become more still you can almost not realize you're floating in water the temperature is so similar to your own that you just don't notice it and you could be floating in space or anywhere and you find it such a peaceful and relaxing experience then you hear a splash as your friend has come in the water as well and then they do the same and the two of you just float around for a while before heading back to shore and getting dressed far quicker than you got undressed because of the coolness of the air against your wet bodies 
And then you see, a little way along the shore, is a cabin. And she feel that maybe that would be a good place to warm up. Having come out of that water, and you head down to the cabin. And it doesn't look like there's anyone there. But you knock anyway. And no one answers. And so you open the door and say hello as you open the door. And the door gently creaks open. And you walk into that cabin. And the cabin is dim with just the ambient light shining in through the windows. And as you open the door, you disturb some of the dust in the cabin and can see that dust dancing and floating in the beams of light through the windows. You walk over to the fireplace and you see that there's wood in the fireplace that can be lit And so you light that fire, and instantly there's the most beautiful glow in this cabin. And with that glow, you begin to see more about what's in the cabin. You can see that there are bookshelves around all the walls, densely packed with old books. And you walk over to one of those shelves. And you blow the dust off the old books. And as you blow that dust, so the dust seems to spread from the books. As if you've just blown glitter. It just seems to sparkle and seems to almost chime. Almost like the softest bells have just been blown off that shelf. The tiniest, almost like microscopic bells, thousands of bells. all catching the light, sparkling and twinkling. As that chiming softly fades. And then you blow again on the dust. And this time you notice a very slight glowing around the books. And you wonder why you didn't notice that the first time. But then think perhaps you were just too preoccupied by the sparkling dust. And you pick one of those books off the shelf. And you carefully open that book. And as you do, a blue light begins to just gently shine from the pages, illuminating the room. And you begin to feel this deep sense of well-being and serenity. As if somehow emanating from the pages of that book. Straight onto your face, onto your cheeks. And then through your body is that light, healing, relaxing. And you turn the page and there's a green light seeming to heal and relax through you. And then you turn a page again, and another shade of light. And you realise that somehow these books on this bookshelf are magic. And as you then reach forward and touch the sides of the bookshelf, so the whole bookshelf vanishes and in place of the bookshelf you just see the frame of that shelf and you see an entirely new world the other side and you look back and your friend is just sat there in front of the fire keeping warm and none of this has particularly made much sound. And they don't seem to be aware at all of what has just happened. 
and so you get their attention. And they looked over, startled by what they see. And you take your hands off the side of the bookcase and all the books are back in place. And you wonder how this works from the other side, whether you'd be able to make it through again. And you don't know whether you want to explore it now, or whether maybe you'll come back here sometime in the future. And as you're wondering all this, so out of the window, you see that person and their cat walking past again. And you open the door. And you talk to each other about how you're seeing each other again. And they say that they're just continuing wandering, exploring, that they've headed one way, turned around, and now they're heading home. And you ask who owns this little shack. And they say they don't know. It appears to be abandoned. It's been here for years. That this cabin, they've never explored it themselves. And while you're having this conversation, so the cat comes up to the cabin, wanders into the cabin, and seems to enjoy being by the fire. And then it walks over to one of the walls, and it sits staring up in the corner. And at first, you don't notice, and no one else notices. Then after a while, you're aware that this cat, which is normally very friendly and makes itself known, you're aware that it hasn't been doing that. And this somehow, despite it being in action, seems to interrupt the conversation. And you find yourselves looking at the cat wondering what the cat is looking at. And you go over to the cat, and you ask the cat, almost expecting a response, what they're looking at. And you almost get down on the same level as the cat, and you look up at the eye level of the cat, trying to see what they're looking at. And they just seem to be sat there staring And then you hear the floorboards creak slightly. And you don't think anything of it, really. It's an old cabin. Until you notice the cat's eyes have moved. And you realise this cat seems to see something that's unseen. And so you pretend that you haven't noticed this. And you walk round in front of where the cat's looking, where its eyes are tracking. And you quickly step sideways to be in front of wherever they're looking. And you feel yourself bumped into. And as you get bumped into, so a person fully dressed in purple seems to almost decloak in front of you. And this startles everyone for a moment. But you quickly realise that they seem very friendly. And they explain that this is their cabin. They've lived here for centuries. That they look after the lock. They make sure that the magic here is looked after. And they're not really good with people, so they always make themselves disappear when people are around, hoping that people will just stay briefly. 
before moving on and carrying on with their journeys. And it's rare for people to stay longer than that. The people normally are hiking from one location to another, but perhaps just need somewhere to rest very briefly. And so they explain that they just make themselves invisible and stand in a corner out of the way. People come in, they look around, they admire the place. And people normally then, once rested and refreshed, carry on with their journeys. And a perfectly respectful of the environment, of the cabin. And that in hundreds of years, you're the first to notice them. And so you ask them, if they're hundreds of years old, how long do they live? Who are they? Where are they from? And they explain that there was a time When there were wizards, there were witches, there are many creatures that are nowadays thought of as mythical. And that some things have passed into legend. And some of those legends are true. Others are exaggerations of the truth. That there's even a lady who lives in the lake outside it just turns out that there are stories about a lady in a lake and they got the wrong lake because the stories have travelled through time. And there's a sense of fascination at what's being told and they ask what's through the portal or through that bookcase that they saw. And they say that's a connection to a spirit world, to a world where many of the mythical creatures still exist, a world where everyone's free to be themselves, where people don't hide the fact that they can do magic. People aren't afraid of dragons, the world there hasn't progressed in the same way as the world here. It's just one of those connecting points between the two worlds. But that you can never really go through there if you're just a normal human. Because as soon as you release your hands from the bookcase, the portal shuts. And on the other side of the portal... There isn't a way back by doing the same thing. But there is ways humans can go through and can return. But it's best to have guidance to do that. And as it's getting later and later, they advise that that isn't something for them now. And the person with their cat, Tyrone, almost in a state of confusion, continues their journey. And the whole time this wizard was talking, the cat was rubbing themselves against him, circling through his legs, trying to climb up onto his lap. And he would pet that cat. And so they carried on their journey. And you and your friend carried your journey on, heading back to the hotel. And you knew that you'd be spending a couple more days here before heading all the way back to London, hoping that the train journey back will be more straightforward and less eventful 
than the train journey here. And that the entire experience has been an unusually eventful one with two separate types of portals. A scientific portal you did pass through and a magical portal you wanted to pass through. And you know you'll be wanting to come here on holiday again. And on arrival back at the hotel, aching a little from all the walking, you head down to the spa. You relax in a jacuzzi. And in that jacuzzi, the floating lotus flowers. that just gently move on the surface of the water. As you lie back, close your eyes and just feel the bubbles massaging your legs around your belly, your arms, your back and up around your neck. And then you go and spend some time in some of the spa rooms, smelling different smells, deeply relaxing. Then that night heading to bed, knowing you've got more holiday to look forward to, more memories to make. And you feel so deeply and comfortably relaxed. You find it so easy to just drift and flow to sleep. And after a few days on holiday here, the two of you make an uneventful journey all the way home. Arriving late at night in London, Heading back to your home in London. And despite the pleasure of being away, there's a strange sense of even more pleasure at being back home, at sleeping in your own bed, settling down in your own bed. And you close your eyes and you begin to breathe so comfortably. And you drift asleep. And as you drift asleep, you almost have this sense of your eyes being open even though you know they're closed. And you know that's a sign you've gone so deeply and comfortably asleep. So deeply and comfortably asleep. That you've begun dreaming. That you're lucid back in your dreams again. And you find yourself using this experience to learn to piece together the knowledge, the wisdom of everything you've experienced. How the science and the magic may connect. How the dreams you had during your journey may be connected to all this. As you have this sense almost of floating out of your body, gaining a new perspective on everything. having this sense of beginning the experience of deeply connecting and understanding the world. Having a tantalizing feeling of everything being just on the tip of your tongue and within grasp. with that sense of wonder and curiosity, knowing when you awaken in the morning you'll always feel so good and alert and refreshed. 
you enjoy the experience of drifting, floating and relaxing asleep.